despite the awareness which is out there about this issue clear policies about sexual harassment in workplace still the problem remains pre uh, prevalent and to the extent that you know especially if you look at the united states of america sexual harassment at workplace has been illegal for 53 years now yet it happens every day and this is where the question comes up where is the problem is it with the legislation or is it with something else actually it's not about making laws and you know passing very strong uh, legislations on this issue the fundamental problem is the mindset of the people if right values are not ingrained in the minds of the boys and the girls from very early stages of their lives about the nature of male-female relationship, then you can have the strongest of legislations, but it's not going to work. It is the issue of tarbiyat. It is the issue of, you know, giving the right values and morality uh, to the society. So the problem with the West at the moment is that when you look at secular morality, you know, especially based on the views of uh, Sigmund Freud and even philosophers like Bertrand Russell, you see, they have looked at this whole issue of sexuality and the human desire. And they say that, you know, the problem is that this desire has to be fulfilled. And we have to remove all the restrictions in male-female relationship. As long as there is, you know, mutual consent, doesn't matter. And only when these desires are fulfilled, people actually then will get away from all these problems. They were actually reacting to what they had in the western part of the world. Unnatural and unlogical restrictions put on them from their own church. A church which was promoting celibacy as a higher value than marriage. A church which was saying that marriage is, you know, lesser of the two evils. And so marriage was tolerated. And with that, there was negativity to this whole process of fulfilling the natural desires. And when the church lost its power in the society, you know, the secular minded thinkers came in and they said they went to the other extreme. That we would like to remove all restrictions. Remove restrictions and things will be okay. Because people's desires would be fulfilled. As long as there is mutual consent, it doesn't matter whether you are single or married. You know, it doesn't matter at all. But we have seen people like, you know, Freud and Russell have died more than 50 years ago. And the Western society still is suffering with those problems. You know, you look at the modern lifestyle and the promiscuity that it, it has. This free attitude towards morality as far as sexuality is concerned has not resolved the problem. You know, look at Canada or US or many other, you know, Western uh, countries. They have the best of universities around the world. Most advanced science and technology, you know, as far as method and invention is concerned. And a very high standard of living. In spite of all this, when it comes to the issue of sexual has harassment, it is there. So it is not ignorance, it is not poverty, it is not lack of, you know, science and technology or money. It has everything to do with morality. And the morality which should be based on the divine teachings. What does Islam have to say about it? Islam did not ignore this phenomenon in human life. Islam does not say that, you know, these desires that we have are evil. Rather, we believe that these desires have been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And he has allowed us to fulfill them. But within the sacred bounds of marriage between a man and a woman, I should make it clear here. Any other way of fulfilling that desire is considered to be a major sin. 
So yes, Islam took away that negativity from that relationship, but within the parameter of the marriage, uh, you know, bonds. There is not, it's actually considered to be the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a sign of Allah's power and glory. However, we have to remember, the desires are there, the right way of fulfilling the desire is there. But there is someone, someone else, whether you like him or not, he is always there with you. And that is shaitan. Shaitan is always there to ignite the spirit of rebellion against divine commandments. And therefore Islam says you have to constantly train yourself when it comes to the issue of tarbiyat. And to be aware of this temptation of the shaitan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Shams that we recite in Namaz Eid, he is very clear about it where he says, وَنَفْسِمْ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا By the soul of the human being that he created, فَعَلَهَمَهَا فُجُورُهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا He inspired to the soul of every human being the basic understanding of what is evil and what is good. And then he says, قَدْ عَفْلَهَا مَنْ زَكَّاهَا you know, successful as a person who keeps that nafs and soul purified with the teachings of revelation and the prophets who come. And failure is the person who lets that nafs become corrupted with sins. And so, you know, people like Harvey um, Weinstein, these are the example of that failure. Money is there, knowledge is there, everything is there. But khasirat dunya wal akhirah. You know, there is total loss in this dunya and akhirah. And remember this issue of temptation of the shaitan. Nobody is immune from it. Neither a teacher nor a coach. Neither a priest or a muallim of Quran. Neither a president sitting in the Oval Office or a bishop in the sanctuary of his own cathedral in Boston. You know, neither you're talking about the medical professionals or policemen. Every field of this dunya, every area of human society, shaitan has his own, you know, traps for every kind of people. And this is where we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this issue. How to prevent this. And Islam has taken this very seriously. If you look at the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran about it, you will see that he actually talks about this issue in a more serious manner than many other examples. Salawat Pranayik Parakal. You will see there are many, many commandments in the Quran where Allah says, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. He just simply says, la taqtulu, don't kill. You know, don't do that. La tashriku, do not do shirk. But when it comes to the issue of this temptation of the shaitan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a different language there. Different style. You know, in Surah uh, Isra, Surah Bani Israel, Surah number 17, ayah 32, he says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاهِشَةً وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا He doesn't say, don't do zina. Don't, don't have illicit relationships. Rather he says, لا تقربوا Do not even go close to it. Everything else he says, don't do it. Here he says, لا تقربوا Do not even go close to it. In Surah A'raf, Surah number 6, Ayat 151, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before and after this ayat, actually has what we call Ten Commandments of Islam. You know, you talk about the Ten Commandments of Moses, even in Surah Araf, ayat number 50, and some ayats, before, 150, before and after it, you have the Ten Commandments there. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا تشركوا You know, do not do shirk. ولا تقتلوا Do not kill innocent lives. Then he talks about this issue. وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الْفَوَاهِشَ مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا وَمَا بَطَنْ Do not even go close to the indecencies. 
ما ظهر منها وما بطن whether this indecent act or relationship is obvious and open or it is being done secretly in both forms Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says لا تقربوا do not even go close to it what does it mean when he says do not even go close to it لا تقربوا do not even go near it do not approach it it means anything which in the first, you know, look will see, it seems to be very, you know, innocent. There is no hurmat there. But if you know that if this continues, you will be led to the second step. And then third, and then fourth, eventually you will reach to what is known as fahisha and indecency. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, be careful before it. Take precautions before so that you do not even reach to that point. 